Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second webinar of the webinar series brought to you by the National Compadres Network and sponsored by DHCS. Our webinar today entitled Cargas y Regalos, the Challenges and Culturally Based Strengths of Raza, will be moderated by Mr. Jerry Tellio. Today's presenters are Dr. Yvette Flores Ortiz. Dr. Flores Ortiz is an Associate Professor of Chicano and Chicana Studies at UC Davis. She is an expert on Latino mental health issues, including adolescence, aging, violence, self-esteem, AIDS prevention, substance abuse, and sexuality. Our next presenter is Dr. Ricardo Carrillo. Dr. Carrillo is a private practice clinical forensic psychologist. He is currently the director of a prevention and early intervention project for La Clinica de la Raza, and he does research for the California Endowment on Disparities in Latino Mental Health. Our final distinguished presenter on this panel today is Mr. Cuco Rodriguez. Mr. Rodriguez has over 18 years of social service experience. He is the Division Chief of Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health Services for the County of Santa Barbara. His responsibilities include overseeing and implementing MHSA services as well as providing leadership and oversight of cultural competence requirements for alcohol, drug, and mental health services. Welcome presenters. Now, just as we go into a few housekeeping, um, this webinar will be recorded and can be found on the CIMH YouTube channel. Everyone at this moment is on mute by default. And if you have any questions, please write in your questions box and we'll capture your questions. And the moderator will um, try to answer them as we go along with the um, presentations. Or we will also address them during our question and answer session. Um, if you have a comment and you would like um, to verbalize your comment, please raise your hand by clicking on the icon that looks like a hand, and we will unmute your line. Okay, as of right now, I am going to now turn it over to Jerry, and we will go ahead and begin with the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, buenos dias. Good morning to everybody, and uh, I want to thank especially the panelists that have um, agreed to share their knowledge and wisdom and experience with us today, but to all of you as well um, that, that have um, blessed us with your presence uh, today. We thank you as we go on this journey to attempt to, to find a, uh, that interconnection between uh, gifts or harmony, uh, blessings in our lives, and those things which become challenges, which we would call cargas or, or baggage. Um, if you were on the, the webinar last, uh, last week, you, um, we began by talking about the significance of tradition and, and culture. And we acknowledge that in all cultures all over the world, there was a way of honoring that became a, a significant uh, part of, of everyday life. Whether you honored uh, the, the greater source, whether you honored your relations, whether you honored yourself, you honored the day, the rising of the sun or uh, the uh, transition to the moon and the earth, the wind, all of those things. And so we want to begin uh, in, in, in the way that we've been taught by our ancestors is to, is to ask for permission and give thanks to, to all the universe, to all the relations, um, to all uh, our elders, and we thank them for all this wisdom and traditions and, and the things that they left us along the way, the sacrifice that they have made in order to allow us to be here. And uh, we thank the women, uh, the first uh, givers of life, and those that teach us about nurturance and about love, and really are the first leaders in, in guiding us. We thank the men that are the duality, El Otro Yo and La Quech, uh, um, and we thank them for their courage and their leadership as well, and nurturance, and, and finally for that fourth direction of the children, in which we do all of this for. And it's said that what, whatever we do today will affect seven generations. And so we uh, attempt to do this in a good way, a very humble way, be begin by, by um, 
asking permission in that way, but also saying that we, we come in a respectful way. And so what we share today is not to uh, judge in any way or say that our knowledge, the knowledge we share, is any better than anyone else's. And because we're focusing on, on uh, one part of the universe, uh, uh, that which I guess now today we call, we can term Chicano Latino. And, and we talked about that last week, about the whole thing of names. Names are not part of our culture doesn't define us. So we want to begin by acknowledging the collective dignity, love, trust, and respect of all people. And we believe that when all of that comes together, then uh, we have the ability to, to, to bring harmony and, and beauty in our, in our world. So um, these ancestral teachings that, that come from, uh, from all peoples, but, but last week we went over these, the four ancestral teachings that come that are the basis of everything we do you're wanted, you're blessing, everyone has a sacred purpose, that uh, there are teachings or values and teachers uh, that are present and that you are protected, safe, and secure, which means if you do not feel safe, then it's hard for you to learn, it's hard for you to heal, it's hard for you to be, and so our ancestors understood this, and so everything that, that uh, was done um, was with this in mind. But we recognize the generational trauma, too, and, and last week we talked about that generational trauma that uh, we as a people uh, carry, and it's part of who we are, and and historically, we, even though it doesn't get talked about very much, um, and really in the history books, that we recognize that you know, the, the estimates it says here 20 million, but actually the estimates between 20 and 50 million the ancestors of our people were uh, killed, raped, abused, enslaved, and and you know, some of those things you know went on as recently as the 50s, and which in Santa Cruz there were lynchings and things like that. But today. Today we recognize that some of that is still going on in terms of immigration and all the struggles that, that our people go through today. So, um, and the digressionary scale of, of what ends up happening to us, so the confusion in our spirit, our identity, anger, the hate, the self-hating rage. And this is what we covered last week uh, a little more extensively. Um, so we're going to begin today, uh, very, very blessed to have uh, Dr. Flores with us today, and, and, and we... Um, we're going to talk about that duality, that duality, uh, the significance of, of male and female. And, and, and Dr. Flores is going to, going to share her experience and insights in terms of, uh, of working with the women and girls and, and the challenges, the, the struggles, the cargas, if you will, but also the blessings from the other side. And uh, we'd like to, to welcome you, uh, uh, Yvette. Uh, thank you very much for, for all that you do and your work and your example. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass the palabra to you. Gracias, Jerry. Thank you, everyone. I am truly honored and blessed to be here in your presence. And um, as we move on, I'd like to translate the title of this presentation for you. I titled it the Latina, Perseverance, Passion, Power, and Peace, as we respond to the burdens and the gifts. And as I do that, I would like to offer this presentation and invoke the blessing from my ancestors. Some of the women you see in the photograph that was previously on, on the screen. Uh, on, the, on your left is a photograph of my mother uh, sitting in front of a lion. Uh, she is carrying me. She is with child at that point. And I invoke her because to me she epitomize resilience and passion and power and peace. And when she left this plane at 101 years of age, she left a very profound legacy. The greatest part of it being making me a teacher because she was a teacher in the broadest sense of the word. So what I would like to share with you in this presentation this morning is part of the teachings that she imparted but also a lot of the teachings that I've learned along the way from my comadres, my friends, and from the two You see two little girls, this is my dog. Uh, in this particular presentation, I would like to talk a little bit about how we can bring 
regain and attain balance. How we can create a path for ourselves and get there when there hasn't been a path to balance and to healing and to wholeness in our lives because of the intergenerational trauma that our families carry with us. I'd also like us to think about our own particular burdens as women and to begin to name some of the obstacles and identify the barriers to attaining the balance that leads to mental health. As we move on, in her powerful essay in Telling to Live, Norma Cantu talks about how as Latinas we often are trailblazers. We have to create paths that haven't been there for us. Because Latinas, despite the fact that in the 21st century, we are primarily U.S. born. We continue to have a large influx of immigrants. And as a result of this continual influx of Latinas from the 21 countries that make up Latin America, and the fusion with the raza that has been there since before the United States existed as a nation, we have created particular cultural formations that have been influenced by indigenous cultures. There is no label that captures us, and each of us is unique. But collectively, we continue to face multiple sources of discrimination, racial, ethnic, class, gender discrimination, discrimination on the basis of our sexuality and sexual orientation. And on a daily basis, we're faced with structural or systemic macro and microaggressions. We still face under education or what some scholars label subtractive education. That is, when we enter the educational system as children, full of excitement and wanting to learn, very often we are pigeonholed and labeled and stereotyped without our true essence of peoplehood that we bring being recognized. And that often in the process of education, we are for us to tear away at the layers of who we are, our religion, our spirituality, our culture, our language, our name. And this creates particular legacies for subsequent years, particularly with regards to education, but also in terms of identity and mental health. We know that while more Latinas enter college, fewer graduate. We're still a fraction of 1% of women with higher degrees. But those of us who have passed through the eye of the needle and have attained education, many of us have concentrated and made our lives work, empowering and bringing forward the future generations. Because part of the legacy of the Chicana and Chicano movement is to continue the struggle for violence, to set a modeling experience for younger generations so that we can carry forward and continue to reconnect with the past to make us strong and make us stronger and make us more healthy. Let's move on, please. As we think about the challenges in general that women face, we need to look at what are the challenges to mental health. Uh, yes, um, we're trying to move the slide on. OK. Yeah. Uh. There are a number of disparities, as uh, some of you, I'm sure, who work in the field are aware that while Latinas face a number of adverse circumstances and could access and could benefit from mental health services, Latinas continue to access mental health services at rates that are lower than would be expected. At the same time, studies that have been done find that Latinas have twice the rate of depression as Latino men. They also have very high prevalence of anxiety disorders. They face many situations of intimate partner violence, of sexual violence, of rape and incest, a lot of which happens in the family, a lot of which happens from people they love and trust. All of these experiences result in physical, emotional, and spiritual wounding. For every child and every woman who is abused, for every one of us who has suffered violence, we are embodying not only our own scars, but the scars of the genocide that happened to our ancestors. So the wounding is exacerbated. The trauma is exacerbated by the 
multi-generational trauma that we carry. Those of us who work with women know that most of women's mental health problems have at their root relationship problems that have to do with the fact that women are expected to be relational beings. Women are expected to focus their love, their attention on others and not to prioritize themselves. This creates an imbalance between the burdens and the gifts. So as mental health providers, we need to understand the cultural position of women within families and within societies so we can understand how the problems that they present are nuanced not only by being female, but by being female within particular patriarchal context and within larger context of oppression. To simply address the woman's sorrow and her suffering emotionally does not address the suffering of her people, the suffering of her family, because we are collectivists. As women, we often find it difficult to focus our healing on ourselves alone if we are not also focusing on the healing of our families. It is very critical, in my experience, to look at women's mental health from a life cycle perspective, to understand the different needs and demands and expectations that women face throughout their lives. As children, women may be welcomed into a family and their arrival may be celebrated. Other girls are not so fortunate. Other girls have responsibilities sometimes greater than those that their years should command because they may be part of large families, because they have to help their mothers and fathers because these individuals are working two or three jobs. So while a collectivist perspective says that we all chip in and we all support each other, growing up in the U.S. context where individualism is considered an ideal and a norm, a young child may experience conflict between what she's expected to do and what culturally she knows she should do and what she perceives her peers and others in more distant communities doing. This may be a source of stress. The expectations that sometimes we place on our girls as mothers is greater at times than that we place on our sons. It's also different. In my family, for example, it was believed that women were fundamentally innately strong. So there was an expectation that they would be strong and that they did not need much help. There was a focus on a stoicism and a focus on being fuertes, being strong, being the core, the heart of a family. And while this may make sense within a similar cultural context, it may be a source of confusion when one is in a multicultural context. In adolescence, the expectation for girls changes. And there is a fear and a protection of women as they come of age, because most families recall at a cellular level the fundamental sexual abuse that women have experienced historically and begin to overprotect their daughters and begin to fear for their daughter's safety, which can contribute to anxiety in girls. As we know, the task, task of adolescence is blending of identities, forming a stronger, rooted identity. And for women of color and Latinas in this case, this means integrating racial, ethnic, gender, and sexual identity to find a way to get on the right path, el buen camino, which is something that families expect. But sometimes immigrant parents do not know what the right path looks like in the United States or can directly help their daughters or sons get to that path or navigate that path. It is very critical to understand that as women of the 20th and 21st century, Chicanas and Latinas also face a number of expectations that are, that are the result of the civil rights movements, of the women's movements and the Chicano and Chicana movement. So women are expected not only to be the heart of the family, but they're also expected to be, in some families, guerrilleras, the warriors that are going to carry on the political struggle and at the same time reproduce and have children and support spouses. And there is an expected heteronormativity 
in Latino cultures that can be very problematic for bisexual, lesbian, transgendered women who do not fit the particular molds that have been expected of them, that have been thrust upon them, as it were. So I'd like to call attention to a recent publication. Uh, it's a two-volume series entitled The Essential Handbook of Women's Sexuality. And uh, we can see the, the picture, hopefully. Um, and this is put on by Prager. And in the second volume, there is a chapter on Latina sexualities in the plural, which I had the privilege of authoring. And I would encourage you to examine the series, have your bookstores order it, your libraries order it, because it's a great resource where women's sexuality is viewed in a healthy, whole way. It is not problematized. The focus isn't only on Latinas' uh, reproductive, reproductive rates, but rather what as, as family members, as community members, as educators, as healers, we can do to promote the healing of these historical legacies of sexual abuse that Latinas and other women of color carry. Because in order to get rooted into who we are in a holistic way and to help the next generation of men and women grow into healthy adults, we need to have come to terms with our own sexualities and our own understanding of our bodies and their connection to our minds and our spirits. So when we think about healing Latinas, and as we move on to, to that slide, it's the focus as educators, as family members, as mental health providers, clearly ought to be in gaining and creating balance for ourselves so that we can mentor those with whom we come in contact. And how, as wounded healers that many of our as are, as wounded educators, how can we begin to reconnect and find balance in our lives so that we can appropriately mentor others? That is collective work. And I firmly believe that we can do it. We can do it collectively by having conversations like this one in each woman's life, in her own world, to feel entitled to set limits, to say no, to think of herself, to put herself in the equation. And this is sometimes difficult work to do with women clients because often when they do that, people in their family or in their community, their peer system, will begin to label them as selfish, will begin to think that they're too individualistic, that they're overly acculturated. But when we think of health in a holistic manner, if a woman doesn't take care of herself, she cannot parent, she cannot nurture as well as she could if she takes care of herself. And setting limits is very, very important. And to do that, women need to find allies on the path. We need to learn how to acknowledge our needs as women and to name the injustices that have been perpetrated against us in order to be able to heal from them and to move forward and to present more appropriate models. The motto of my generation was that the revolution begins at home. And so as we think about Latino families and as we work with Latino families, it's important to understand the cultural context of each individual family. It is equally important to understand the individual psychological needs of the people in that family. And as the expected heart of the family, we need to prioritize the position and the needs and the health of women within family systems. It is our charge, our ethical charge, to create a better context for the next generation that comes, to identify the teachable moments in our work when we can support women in their struggles to gain balance, to become more rooted, to become more connected to the past, but not to focus on the suffering of the past, but rather to identify the cultural strengths and cultural resources that allowed and facilitated the survival of the women who came before them. 
Every family has women who pasaron desapercibidas. It seemed that people didn't even know their existence, but their stories are, are there. We need to recapture those stories of the women who came before us, because inherent in those stories are powerful lessons of survival. I very humbly uh, offer to you uh, a book that I recently authored that just came out in March, in which um, I've asked permission to, to share with you and with whoever reads it, what I have learned over the last 30 plus years of being in the mental health profession. And the book is, you can find it on Amazon. You can also have your bookstore order it, your small town bookstore. It would be great to support them. Uh, it's published by the University of Arizona Press, and which I found to be particularly ironic that the University of Arizona Press has the Mexican American Experience series, uh, while the state of Arizona bans uh, books on Chicanos and Mexicanos and Latinos and indigenous people. Um, to close, I would just like to once again thank you for listening and thank you for allowing me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you and I give thanks to the Creator for giving us all the strength to do the work that I do. Thank you, Dr. Flores. You know, um, as you were as you were talking, I was flashing on my my grandma, and my my mom, my sisters, and even my daughter. And you know, it it uh, it just uh, brings to mind, uh, you know, the Lotro Yo, the other side. But it, but as you were talking about, you said sometimes, you know, immigrant. Uh, families we don't uh, we don't get the the opportunity to begin to understand and to deal with 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 things and and so when our daughters then grow up we're not sure how to deal with it and and I'll just tell you from my perspective you know as, as, a, as a father that uh, you know I got scared when my daughter became uh, you know started becoming of age because I was not sure I had not seen how to be with for the daughter and and it and it stirred when she says, "Hey, Dad, I want to go out, and this guy's going to take me out." It was secretly, you know, this, this fear came in, and and I was wondering, where did this come from? You know, I mean, now I know that you know there's some genetic memory, some genetic fear, some uh, some generational stuff going on there. And, and but you know, as, as, but without that awareness, you know, what do parents do, and how do they get stuck, and how do they pass on either the the the, the, the sometimes the baggage unknowingly you know and 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 so I think that this is important this dialogue and this awareness and us being being uh, able to to open up the dialogue to to all of us and especially the mental health practitioners that see families that see a lot of adolescent young girls um, that supposedly are acting out or getting in trouble or depressed or whatever whatever the the symptomatology is underneath that many times as you as you mentioned early on is the whole relationship aspect. So I really appreciate, you know, um, you opening various avenues of, you know, of, of thought, so that we can begin to explore this, and 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 it should be an essential part of what uh, any practitioner, anyone that's working with fa families, consider. Thank you, Jerry. I agree, and I think that as la the Latino population ages, because there are a number of us who are baby boomers too, uh, it creates an opportunity for those of us, particularly elders in the field, to emphasize the importance of the storytelling, which you so masterfully and beautifully and sensitively do, uh, because that's one of the ways in which the younger generations can get this history that they're not getting in the schools, that is not in the books and that needs that they need in order to feel that they belong on this land to feel that they're entitled to all of the riches that this land can offer us and to strengthen their spirits so that they can take on the challenges that are going to come because they're going to come yes well thank you and, and dr flores will be um available at the end of the, of the webinar for questions. If people have questions, uh, uh, she'll be available to answer those questions. Uh, I want to thank you once again. Um,
Now we're going to move on to el otro yo. We say en la quech, the other side, the duality, and we know life is about that duality, about that male-female spirit. And so um, very, very glad and honored to, to uh, have to share today is a compadre, great friend, a colleague uh, um, of mine that's been on this road for, for a long time as well. We've, uh, you know, we, we've been uh, attempting, you know, for many, many years to trying to find that balance uh, with men and boys. And, uh, you know, and I see uh, uh, Dr. Carrillo um, really uh, one of the pioneers in this, this area as well, and, and really blessed and pleased that uh, you can join us. Thank Ricardo. You got palabra. Thank you, Jerry. <clears throat> Thank you, Yvette, for that wonderful uh, presentation. Always uh, so eloquent <clears throat> and clear about uh, the issues, uh, mental health issues. And uh, I want to say that what we're uh, attempting to share with you today, uh, the, my presentation is not my presentation. My presentation is the culmination and uh, collaboration of many men, many men in the uh, United States, in Mexico, in Central America, in the Caribbean, that have, uh, that have been attempting to gather for a long time. Uh, the Compadres Network has been doing this work for 25 years, and we have learned just a little bit about uh, what really happens to us as men. <clears throat> and so this is what I'm going to share today, is really more of the storytelling that the men have uh, have brought to us in Circulo. We've uh, been meeting in Circulo for uh, 25 years. Uh, Circulo is a, uh, it's not a therapy, but it's therapeutic. It is not religious, but it is spiritual. And uh, the beginning of all of our work begins with a prayer. So I want to offer a prayer as we begin today, an African prayer that says, we pray for the children that have a long way to walk. We pray for the elders that have walked a long way. <clears throat> and we pray for us that have to take care of them both. And so when we're born into a, a family that appreciates us, that loves us, that cares for us, that understands that we are in fact a blessing, uh, you develop a, a security about yourself. You, you know uh, life is good and uh, you fit in the world. Tienes un lugar. You have a sacred purpose in life. And as a result of that, you learn values that really help you respect and you develop dignity and you understand the word confianza. You understand uh, having uh, trust, you're trustworthy. And uh, when it's given with affection, you understand that, you understand the notion that we call cariño. And so you, you are raised in a very good way, in a, in a very blessed way, in a very secure way. And that really sets the foundation for you to be able to have what Yvette and Jerry have been talking about, which is relationships and interdependence, a way in which people can connect, uh, appreciate, value, honor, honor each other. But when you're raised in situations when you don't receive these gifts, you are raised in an environment where caretakers, your parents aren't available to be present, can't give you what you need, uh, are poverty stricken, uh, have not been available for whatever reason, then we run into difficulties in terms of not having the foundation and we begin to develop uh, ways of relating to each other that really are based on uh, our fear-based living, their traumatic uh, we are raised scared. And a lot of the difficulties that Latino men uh, suffer in this, uh, in this uh, environment, and I have worked uh, for many years, I'm a psychologist for 30 years, and I've worked in state prisons, I've worked in psychiatric hospitals, in outpatient clinics, in juvenile halls, uh, in the community. And I've seen uh, our people, uh, many of them come into treatment, come into consultation, come into looking for some assistance because they're living in this way. Uh, the, uh, the important thing about understanding folks is that there is a foundation uh, and the foundation of living in a secure way is based on having uh, people available to you that are interconnected. We know that in the current psychological theory, theory of attachment that our central nervous system will develop appropriately and correctly if we are touched, if we are held, 
if we are attended to. Uh, attachment theory says to us when we're raised and we have a secure attachment, I see you, I understand you, and I'll take care of you. I'll love you. I'll be there for you. And that allows us to have a regulation of affect. It's a very beautiful thing when I see my grandchildren, uh, my grandson, uh, who says to me, uh, uh, you know, uh, Nico, do you want to go play? And he gets so excited, his eyes light up. Yeah, Grandpa, I want to go play. And we get to the park, and unfortunately, the uh, slides aren't working that day. The uh, swings uh, are under construction, and my grandson says, you know, Grandpa, I'm mad, I'm angry. Uh, why, Nico? Well, I wanted to play with you, and, and the slides aren't working. And, and so he's upset, and then we fantasize and play Pirates of the Caribbean with some sticks, and very quickly he moves into that play time, and then it's time to go, Mijo, and you know how children are, their shoulders go down, and their the eyes get sad, and they get very quiet. And uh, then on the way home, we stop uh, someplace and get him an ice cream, and he says, you know what, Grandpa, I had, I had a nice time with you today. And so that is really an example of regulation of affect. When we have security in our relationships and people love us, we can do that. We have that kind of flexibility to experience all of the rainbow and all of the, all of everything in our in our repertoire of emotion. And so, uh, unfortunately, many of our people uh, have been traumatized. They suffered, uh, and so attachment theory isn't appropriate uh, for folks when you're raised in environments where there's abuse, abandonment, violence, war-torn situations. Uh, because now the regulation of affect isn't available. Now people are frozen in their uh, psychology and in their perception and the way they see the world because they're living in fear. They are hyper aroused. They're having nightmares. They're being attacked, whether it's perceived or whether it's real. For many of our people, whether they're children, adolescents, adult men, uh, immigrants, we have experienced a significant amount of trauma, let alone the fact that we talked about intergenerational trauma, the kind of trauma that people experience in their host uh, uh, countries given the context of the colonialization. We're talking about uh, situations that repeatedly happen. So they affect our functioning and we're living not in the cortex, not in the ability to have emotion and compassion and empathy but we're living in a survival mode. The limbic system is what's hyper-aroused. So the intent here is for us as mental health practitioners to understand theory, understand attachment, and understand where our folks might be. So part of our assessment strategies, our understanding, uh, and we will speak uh, briefly about that, our process to understand people is not a diagnostic nomenclature or a way to look at somebody uh, in, in, in a label form, but really to try to make some sense out of who are you, el conocimiento, and in that conocimiento I get to know whether my client, uh, uh, my uh, compadre is suffering from, uh, from uh, limitations in his attachment style. So just like Yvette was eloquent in explaining the issues for women, uh, men uh, come with these difficulties. Uh, many men that have migrated to this country have migrated under situations historically we can uh, go back uh, you know, to the 19th century, La Revolución de Mexico, uh, people coming over, the Bracero movement, uh, all kinds of different ways. These days we've got um, people coming from Central America that are, are evading and avoiding uh, war-torn situations, repression, discrimination, a targeted, uh, their lives are being targeted because of the war and the repressive that's happened there, and then they're violated uh, coming across the borders and then ultimately coming to the United States. So we're talking about complex trauma. We're talking about people that have, for this generation, generation before that, have experienced civil wars, have experienced horrendous um, uh, psychological war-torn trauma that they bring with them. Our people, our young people are the military. If you take a look at the military in the United States, the people that are serving are poor whites, Latinos, African Americans, some Asians, certainly lots of Filipinos. People that have 
come and migrated and believe in this country are serving the country. My children are all involved in the military and I've seen the impact of multiple deployments on folks. And the same grief and loss and abandonment and neglect and unavailability happens when people are incarcerated. We know the statistics that our prisons and juvenile detention centers are filled with young men, young black and brown men. Uh, living in the barrio, living in the ghetto, uh, here in Oakland, we have, uh, we have the highest rate of robberies and homicides on the West Coast, and uh, it's not getting any better. And so when people live together and they have already been accustomed to being poverty-stricken and having to fight for everything, uh, and you have weapons around, uh, people are traumatized. So I'm working with people that are repeatedly uh, traumatized. The level of discrimination has to be taken into consideration because of the lack of employment, the lack of opportunity, the lack of availability, and the lack of services, the lack of culturally relevant social services and mental health services for people that come in need. And so we're lucky to have people like Yvette, uh, the Compadres Network, La Clinica de la Raza, uh, Instituto Familiar de la Raza, La Frontera, El Centro, programs that have focused in on attempting to be language specific, culturally relevant, and embracing. And I think that's really what we need to talk about is what do men need? And what men need is to have an availability to have people be present and available to them. And I, now I want to uh, use my time efficiently and I want you to hear some of the stories that some of our men have done. So let me just share one, one of these two vignettes. Um, uh, th uh, there is a, uh, I worked with a uh, uh, Oaxaqueño, a, a Mexican uh, immigrant who came here uh, to work. And he uh, came into therapy because uh, him and his uh, uh, significant other were, ha were having difficulties. He had uh, already uh, been unfaithful one time in the relationship, had been uh, chemically dependent, was alcoholic, using a little bit of cocaine. And uh, really in the assessment of understanding who he was, came to see that his attachment was significantly impaired. He suffered from a dismissing attachment style. He had been raped as a young boy, uh, had never told anybody about that, was homeless, uh, abandoned by both his mother and father. Mother was very limited intellectually and wasn't able to be available uh, to him. So he lived on the streets and, and found uh, a way to survive by fighting for himself. So he's a fighter. He comes in and he's fighting. And, He's domestically uh, violent, he's uh, chemically dependent, and more than anything else, he's lost. He doesn't know who he is, doesn't know where he's at. So perfect situation for explaining what it is that people need. What he needed was somebody to embrace him, somebody to be available to him, somebody to hold him and say, you know what, you need, a lot of, you need to do a lot more work than just you and this lady friend. So that relationship ended for him. And he worked uh, together with me for about two and a half years. And in those two and a half years, he identified what it was that uh, his wounds were, where he was traumatized, how the trauma affected the way he saw himself and he saw other people. And little by little, he began to find that if he worked with, with jewelry, if he worked with seeds, if he worked with gems, he could make some balance of his life. He could find some way to connect and, and, and do it in a very concrete, concrete way. He responded to the idea that maybe the four elements required his attention, the fire that he carried inside, the water that he needed to uh, stay away from the alcohol, the breath that he needed to breathe and understand, and that sometimes his head was up in the clouds and he needed to be firmly planted on Mother Earth. And so he began to develop relationships with the elements. He began to have prayer time for himself. He began to have some meditative quality. And he put all of his energy into his work, his artwork. And now he has his running his own business. He uh, looks like he's going to marry an American gal and get a citizenship uh, attended to. But more important than anything else, he's a very active member in our San Jose Circulo. So uh, what I want to do is I want to share with you. Hey, Carla, uh, let, me, let me just let me just because uh, I'd like to just um, you know the the case that you just shared really is a, a beautiful example of because you mentioned embracing uh -huh. and, and and nothing in your um, in your your presentation 
had anything to do with shame or guilt or anything like that, but embracing. And mm -hmm. I think that when you talk about attachment, uh, you know, uh, attachment issues, that when someone has been, not has done. not had a connection, that that how important it is for somebody that's working with you to uh, to accept you, to acknowledge you, and accept you with the regalos that you have that you're able to bring out of him, but also the the, the tremendous amount of generational struggle and the circumstantial issues that have affected his life, that then has uh, you know, impaired him. And I think uh, you know it's a beautiful example of that of of embracing the baggage without shaming him, making him accountable, but at the same time then attempting to help him to build on, on his gifts and, you know, allowing him then to flourish in terms of, you know, making things with his hands, you know. Yeah. Well, I think the important thing, and we, we've done that when we do national trainings here in Nigeria, so we yeah. try to get people to understand, you know, how is it that you are a blessing? And from a clinical perspective, you know, are you going to be available? Are you the one? Are you the one clinically that somebody who comes in to see you can count on, can share with you the trauma, the pain, the shame, the, the guilt, the vergüenza, whatever it is that they're experiencing without that judgment? And I think one of the things for Latino men is no tenemos lugar. We don't have a place. We have a place in a, you know, our pueblito or a provincia ya in Mexico or Central America. We come to look for work and how many jornaleros are on the street, you know, looking for work because there's just... Not, not any other way to provide for their families. And they make that sacrifice. And they come over here and they leave their children, they leave their significant others, their mothers, their, 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 their daughters. They leave the familia here in hopes of making life better. So they're displaced. And Samuelín Martínez will talk uh, next week about being deslocado. That, that's what drives us crazy, the disconnection. And this is just normal migration, let alone add war-torn situations on to that where you didn't even fit in your family of origin or you come from a country where uh, brothers and brothers fought against each other and so uh, and you haven't had an opportunity to process that or understand it. So I think it's crucial that we give men their place, that we understand them and I think conocimiento is crucial uh, for us to do that. Really get to understand who this person is, what's their story, how they got here, how they're family life, and Yvette uh, and I have done uh, intergenerational work of the families, uh, we can move on, uh, where we really understand the family patterns of the kind of abandonment, neglect, abuse, chemical dependency, how it impacts somebody else. And so the history of the family, the history of the colonialization impact how we see ourselves and how they see themselves. So that then now men can choose, do I want to continue to be chemically dependent, domestically violent, and abandon my kids? Do I really want to do the same thing that my father did to me or that my grandfather did to me? And so I get an opportunity to see that. I do my intergenerational genome and I hear the stories and what do I want my story to be? My story, and I'm talking personally, my story is in my family life of three generations of alcoholics, three generations of domestic violence uh, perpetrators, that that stops, that legacy stops with me, in my sobriety, in my willingness to arrest those destructive patterns that have been part of my family. How they got there? Sure, colonialization, sure socialization, monkey see, monkey do early learning practices, lots of reinforcement, beliefs, distorted beliefs that Latino men are mujeriegos, paranderos, jugadores, that were unfaithful, that were drunks, that were not available. Those perceptions we have to arrest. We have to take responsibility for that so that we can see just how it is that we want to be in our families. And so we also have to take into account the impact of acculturation. And Buku will talk about the impact of Latino mental health and how it is that the more we become like the rest of the population, the, the more disturbing, the, the iller we become, less healthy we become. We start eating fast food, processed foods, we're moving around too much, we're so busy we can't spend time with our families. And then we wonder why our children say to you, oh, now you want to be my dad? Now you want to talk to me? Where, where have you been? because you haven't been here. You've been working two or three jobs. And so we have to 
earn that. We have to take responsibility for that. How can we make ourselves present and available? And that's how we can define for ourselves this notion of cargas and regalos. What carga do I have? What baggage do I have? Where do I leave it? And we teach men how to leave it in the fire. We teach them to pay attention to things that are important to them, that really they believe is important of those old values when you were born, when you were told that you were a blessing. So, and that's how we really appreciate the regalos. And what I want to do as we close my part of this presentation is I want to share with you uh, the impact of what happens when men come and they get uh, the uh, the understanding that it's possible to leave the carga. These are a couple of vignettes from our compadres uh, over the 20 years that we've been working, 25 years that we've been working with them. Uh, the first one is uh, is Hyman. Hyman is a, a very uh, very important case. Yeah, the the um, these vignettes are, are taken at uh, the annual retiro that we do, and this was the 20th year uh, of us gathering and and. Uh, we asked permission of these men to to, uh, to share their story, and uh, this was after a couple of days of, of gathering and of, of doing ceremony and 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 sharing cargas and regalos and uh, doing all of that. And and uh, here's a couple of the. the uh, oh, wait a minute. Something's happening. <laughs> Let's see. If we can get this to work. Well, just, uh, just so you understand, uh, Jaime comes uh, to us uh, after having lived his entire life um, incarcerated, <clears throat> a shot caller for a Sudeño group down in Southern California, struggling to be a better father. He wants to be a father. His uh, wife is in uh, uh, drug and alcohol treatment, and uh, we invite him to join us. And this is his first, really, connection with uh, other men uh, in a healing way. and. Um, Hopefully we can get uh, his uh, perception. Yeah, get this, uh, I don't know if they can, you guys can help me on it then. Yeah, yeah one, just momentarily we'll go ahead and get that uh, rolling. Okay, all right. So, um, and just to share that, that uh, you know, we, we, we started 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of men gathered because we were very distressed by what was going on in our community and especially uh, as men, as Chicano, Latino, Native men, we... Um, we were very distressed that we were hurting a lot of our families and hurting a lot of our children. And so we decided to come together and gather. Um, and Ricardo and I you know, called to a bunch of other men. And, and at that time, it was uh, kind of a, uh, a new thing. Uh, people could not understand why men would want to gather. What are we gathering for? We're not going to drink. We're not going to party. How can? Um, but we did, and, and that became a whole process of, of healing and development. And, and we have circles all across the country, and, and uh, we've been gathering now for for uh, more than 25 years in this way. And so we're trying to uh, see if we can show this this clip here. It's been a very very good experience for me. It's helped me you know, see things like family family values. Between men, you know, I've never thought that, I've never been around, I never thought it was okay to hug another man and, you know, I've seen a, a father kiss his son, you know, and those are just things I've never seen before. And it blew my mind. And I see how much love and how that, how strong their bonds are. And that, that's something I've always wanted because I never had a father. It wasn't because he wasn't around or because he was dead, it was just because he died when I was two. And um, that's what I want to give my kids. That I want to have that kind of relationship. I started going to these conferences and I met these men there. And I remember my first experience meeting these men, the homeless, right? People of the homeless. And I remember one man in particular, uh, Hector Sanchez Flores, who would talk about his wife. Uh, Different way than I had observed other men talking about their, their, their parejas, you know, and talking about things and sacredness and men and palabra and all these different concepts that I would 
relatively new to me. And like I said, if those other hombres that were living in the kind of living in darkness and in the shadows were a mirror to me, and those jovencitos that I saw in my barrio, those other young men were a mirror to me. These men also looked like me, but they were talking in a different way. They didn't talk the way I was accustomed to hearing men talk. They talked in a very respectful and dignified manner. And they talked about things that were important that I was a little bit kind of scared to talk about things like that, you know? Because I it was, it was so new and I remember I remember looking at somebody next to me, an older guy. We're sitting in the circle and they're talking about he's talking about his wife, Lucy, and he's talking about just the community and all these different things are going on. And they're talking about things that I, I was so so touched by it, but it seems so unreal to me. I said, is this for real, you know? And I remember looking at to my left at somebody and saying, these guys are weird, man. I think these guys are weird. And he looked at me, and with a tear in his eye, he said, that's the way we're supposed to be. And that was my, um, that's the way we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be good men. And uh, I said, well, I can probably be a good man, no? And so that began my road in my introduction to the, to the Circle of the Hombres. And it's been just a beautiful gift to me and my family. It's been a I have to give him back the presenter. Sammy I mean, now leads a, a tremendous uh, organization in Stockton and, and uh, has become you know, really, really an, an, an advocate and a teacher and a leader in terms of, of healing and uh, communities and doing a wonderful job there in Stockton. But all of, he also is a, part of the Compadres Network and one of the great uh, consultants and teachers as well. That, uh, but, but these two are examples. And I don't know if you want to comment on this, Ricardo. Yeah, I just want to wrap up by saying uh, this is what we've had the privilege, the privilege to be part of, to watch men come with their baggage, come with their carga, leave it in the fireplace, take responsibility. This is a shot collar from uh, a gang in uh, Southern California. It's all he knows is prison. All he knows is methamphetamine. All he knows is violence. And he's willing to turn it over. He's willing to accept a different lifestyle because there are men around him that can hold him, that can embrace him, that don't judge him, that help him find his place, not our place, his place, finds his place in the world so that he can arrest what he's been living with uh, all of his life. So thank you for the opportunity uh, to uh, compartir, to share with you, and uh, uh, you know, we invite men to come to our retreats. We invite men to participate in our circles uh, and to continue to do the healing necessary. El es Dios. El es Dios. Thank you, Ricardo. And I just want to mention, uh, you know, also uh, Ricardo and I co-authored a book uh, in terms of uh, he uh, healing men as well and uh, men of, of, of many different cultures. We co-authored with a whole lot of number of other uh, authors. Uh, from, from different uh, ethnic backgrounds as well. You want to mention that title, Ricardo? Yeah. yeah, the book is Family Violence and Men of Color. Uh, we have two uh, s uh, separate uh, publications. The last one's 2010, Springer Publishing Company, and you can find that on Amazon.com. OK, thank you. So now we're going to move on to uh, to one of our other compadres here and uh, who met a long time ago in Santa Barbara. He was running programs there, and now he's is also one of the one of uh, the leaders in, in, in community and uh, teachers and but but also you know works in in the mental health system as well and, and is helping to to guide some of the movements there and a wonderful father um, you know blessed to to uh, you know really know his family and see see him and I think the 
you know, the best uh, credential you can have is, is uh, children that love you. you know? And and so uh, I've seen the love that, that his children have for him. So real, real blessed to have uh, Refugio uh, Rodriguez, we call him Coco. And so, Coco, we're going to turn the palabra over to you. Well, thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, it's it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you all and uh, to be in uh, such good company of the presenters that are here. So um, um, I think, as Jerry said, I, I, I actually currently work for uh, County Mental Health here in Santa Barbara County as the Mental Health Services Act uh, Division Chief and uh, the Cultural Competency Manager. Uh, but prior to this, um, I did a lot of work in the nonprofit side, and uh, actually one of my first trainers and, and teachers was Jerry uh, in kind of doing this work with with uh, adolescent young men uh, and incarcerated um, men in general. Um, so um, what I'm going to give you is uh, if we can move forward uh, to the next slide, um, I'm going to give you uh, kind of a brief um, overview of some of the um, things that, that – um, uh, some of the barriers, I think, that our community faces when it uh, comes to to mental health treatment, and uh, more importantly, treatment that is relevant to their reality. Um, and again, I'm not saying that um, uh, there's obviously a lot more to this, but these are some kind of key areas that that uh, we've identified over you know the last uh, 16 or 15, 16 years in working with these populations. Um, again, you know, I, I, as I indicated, I work with the Mental Health Services Act, and the Mental Health Services Act, um, one of the things that attracted me to this position was the mere fact that a lot of what um, is identified in the act in terms of its principles is directly related to populations that have uh, minimal services or are what, they, what, what uh, are called unserved populations. Um, and when you look at a lot of the intent of the act, it was really intended to serve populations who, who were receiving very uh, minimal services or no services at all. Uh, so for someone like me, that really spoke to me in terms of uh, my community and other communities that are unserved uh, or not served at all. So um, I kind of went into this endeavor, and, and one of the things that struck me is that statewide, um, our own internal local county system created structures that prevented um, services to these populations that were unserved. Uh, and by that I mean, you know, uh, county, our own county bureaucracies that prevented services to undocumented or uninsured populations. So despite the fact that here we had a funding stream, that provided the flexibility that didn't exist in our existing Medi-Cal funding opportunities. Um, instead of allowing that flexibility to afford, you know, to help us serve and do creative things, our own bureaucratic process kind of prevented us from doing that. So I think that that's. I, I want to point out that that's really one of the one of the examples that I have that our our system is really so ingrained in kind of its own process. Um, and in more of a cookie cutter kind of approach to things, is that we don't even realize that within our own system, it's it's it, it goes beyond just saying that we want to expand services to certain populations. We really have to evaluate policies and have to evaluate our structure, and how sometimes um, even uh, programs or even funding in this case that are intended to serve populations um, it doesn't it, it doesn't happen because our own bureaucratic process prevents that from happening, uh, either through policies or through perceptions. Uh, and what I mean by that is that you know even I think in, in the last probably 18 years that I worked in this field, the the social political uh, perspectives that kind of have been uh, permeated into the work that we do uh, is very striking to me. And what I mean by that is that this idea that people's, I mean, when I started doing this work, I don't recall at any time during either my education and my training there being any discussion about um, uh, exclusionary factors in populations. Uh, and in the last probably 10 years, we've seen this this shift where people feel comfortable, I think, 
um, kind of inserting their own perceptions around services to, let's say, undocumented populations. Say, well, this is, you know, they're illegal. Why do we provide services? I can't tell you the number of times that I've heard that in the last eight or nine years that I've been working uh, in, in, in mental health. Um, and, and I think that, uh, again, uh, professionally, that was never uh, the intent of why most of us came into this work. Um, not to look at exclusionary factors. We're trying to be uh, more asset-based. But again, um, to me, policies that are in place prevent, I think, access to populations. And again, uh, the allowance of, you know, when we create those policies, it allows for these perceptions also that also create, um, again, local or, or on the ground level barriers for people to access services. Um, the other, um, I think, um, uh, real challenge that, that I've seen that our systems face is that, in, it, you know, when it, when it comes right down to it, um, when I used to work in, in, uh, with uh, Child Welfare Services uh, as a partner, um, there was this, uh, this concept called differential response. And the concept of differential response is that you have basically different levels of, of, of treatment approaches uh, for people. Um, that there's, a, there's a variety of or a menu of types of services based on kind of where people are at. You know, uh, some of them are voluntary, some may be, you know, it, it varies. Uh, some are not voluntary. But again, there's a differential treatment approach. From a cultural competency standpoint, when we look at our systems, really, um, we, we don't have a differential treatment approach. I mean, we are at a place where we talk about evidence-based practices, for example, uh, but neglect the fact that the majority of evidence-based practices ha have not been tested on communities of color or Latinos, I mean, in general, specific and, and specifically Latino communities. Um, and that's what I mean by a differential treatment approach, which is, and, and that's kind of really been the focus of this presentation, which is how do we include some culturally recognizable approaches to keep, you know, to different communities, just in this case, Latino communities. Um, in most cases, we don't even have a specific ethnic-specific assessments, um, again, which is very, very critical uh, because that will help you at least identify uh, those uh, differences uh, or those values that might be assets uh, or those items within, uh, again, the individuals that we're working with uh, that might be uh, deficits if we so choose to, to, to label them that way. But more importantly, uh, identifying those assets is very key. And again, most of our systems lack even ethnic-specific assessments. And the final thing that I want to point out is that, you know, to me, um, we have moved in our system to this whole electronic health record system. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that um, a lot of counties have done that and we're at probably at a variety of different places within that process. One of the things that struck me is that, um, as I said before, I was from the Ethnic Services or Cultural Competency Manager for our department. We were on a conference call one time and we were talking about uh, expanding or trying to to develop an ethics-specific assessment, uh, and uh, a very large county uh, indicated that their electronic health record system did not have the capacity to accommodate uh, that specific need. Um, and more importantly, the system that that county was utilizing is being utilized through many counties in the state. So here we have, um, again, an electronic health record system that does not have the capacity to, to allow us uh, to grow uh, in, in the development of an ethnic-specific assessment and collect ethnic-specific data in that respect. Um, it's very telling in terms of the way that we prioritize something as important as data collection. And more importantly, the significant investment that we have made in electronic health record systems. And again, there's been absolutely no uh, consideration made to ethnic-specific issues. Uh, and, and again, it creates a, a significant capacity problem. Uh, yeah, we I would never. Go ahead. I, I think I think you know what you, what you're stating really is is uh, the major issue that that the systems and the the uh, uh, therapeutic interventions and the approaches and even you even went into you know how uh, how uh, educational institutions prepare you or don't prepare you for doing your work 
are not ready for the for the uh, multidimensional aspects of ethnic population, and specifically when we talk about Chicano Latino Native population. You know, we in the, in the last webinar talked about you know the whole multicultural aspect of our identity, the the whole uh, differences. Yvette and Chicago just talked about the different levels of trauma, generational trauma, a whole number of things that have no place in terms of consideration uh, presently in our system. And if we're using um, our ability to track and document as the basis for either accepting something or not accepting something, then are we, are, are we if we're talking about cargos and regalos, are we an asset to somebody's mental health or a population's mental health? Or are we more a barrier? And I think that's exactly what you're pointing to. Yeah, and more importantly, I think a lot of us that have been doing this you know, for some time realize um, that the challenge uh, or the, uh, the dilemma that we find ourselves in is when we are requesting services that look a different way or we're requesting any change in the way that we do things, uh, the first response is, do you have data? Um, and here we have a situation where it's kind of a catch-22. We have, uh, again, a dependence on a system that everybody is utilizing, but there is absolutely no way of collecting significant data that's important to us to justify the existence of different approaches. Yeah. So it kind of creates a catch-22 for us. So if we can move on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the other systemic issues I think that impedes uh, treatment for, for our community is is that, and certainly, again, I, I'll refer back to MHSA say because that's one of the largest initiatives with, uh, you know, and, and if you don't know anything about the Mental Health Services Act, um, it's probably the largest influx of, of, of funding to the state of California for mental health services uh, prior, and even then challenging, I would say, in size, uh, short oil medical. Um, it's huge. It is significant. And the one thing that amazes me is that we initiated that effort at the state and local levels with this idea that that all communities have the same understanding of mental health and that all communities have the same level, level of structures. Uh, and more importantly, that stigma is the same across all communities, mm -hmm. when clearly we know that it is not. And again, it, 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 in, in our community, we are at a place in terms of the level of stigma where mental health was probably in this country 15 or 20 years ago. Um, just to give people a, a kind of an accurate picture of what this is, and not only in Latino communities, but in other communities as well. In many of our communities, um, you know, because of our experiences and because of our lack of resources, um, we define mental health system in its, its, in its extreme form, which is it being what we call locura, being crazy. So any other form of, uh, of uh, you know, that's mild depression, whatever that is, you will see a resistance to the acknowledgement that it is a mental health issue. It is something else. It will be physical. There will be, I mean, all sorts of different ways, but, but it, there is a resistance to acknowledging that it is a mental health issue. And again, primarily because we view it very differently. Uh, and because of our experience. Um, so um, the reason I point that out is that if we are going to develop effective approaches in our communities and across the state, we really have to engage uh, many you know, Latino communities as well as other communities, provide outreach and provide education so that we both understand that we're talking about the same thing or that we are providing information about what, when we say mental health what we truly mean by that because right now um, we are having two very different conversations and our community is certainly reluctant to even come in for services because of the level of stigma that exists. Um, I think the other significant, um, I think, Can oversight I of our about system. About Let me mention yeah, go ahead. because I think since we're talking about the generational trauma, I think what a lot of people don't know is that historically uh, in, under colonialism and, and a lot of the oppressive ways, is the oppressor looked for any reason to separate you from your family, to lock you up, or to kill you. And, and one of those reasons is if you're crazy. If you're seen as crazy, you are, you are disconnected from your family, you are locked up, you are put in, a, in, in someplace else, or you were killed. So, so that stigma carried a, a heavy amount of, of, of uh, impact 
on you as an individual, but on your family as well. And, and, Correct. And, and, and especially when we're talking about what, what Ricardo talked about in terms of attachment or detachment, the significant trauma that happened generationally that becomes a trigger for you, that when you're seen as loco or that loco or you're crazy, what does that mean? You no longer, I mean, and it happens, it happens. If you're diagnosed that way and, and, uh, and are seen as, uh, you know, insufficient to, to, or harm to yourself or others, you can be locked away, you can be taken away here. And if you don't have the language you know, to, to help yourself or don't have a lawyer or don't have any advocate, it goes on today. And especially if you, you come from an indigenous culture and don't even speak English or Spanish, I mean, you know, worse. So, um, so I think there's, there's a tremendous amount of weight that people don't understand or, or, or history related to this. It's not just because we're unaware. It's not just because we, we don't know what mental health is and so you come out and define it and well, this is mental health. I mean, no, no. It really comes with some, some generational historical things that is, is connected to racism and oppression as well. And so that's and let me give you a, a and let me give you a, a perfect example of how this plays out for our clients. Um, I work with a lot of single mothers, Latina single mothers, um, who may be documented or undocumented. But the fear is still the same in terms of why they do not access mental health services. And the number one fear that they have is that they feel uh, the perception is that if they are diagnosed uh, with a mental health issue that they will lose custody of their children. Um, and again, that's, that's not true, but their experience has taught them uh, exactly what you're pointing out. So even though they acknowledge that they have a mental health issue, they avoid services because of that fear of loss over their children. So we, it is not uncommon to have uh, single mothers who go without treatment for a very long time until it becomes a, a critical mental health issue, they end up in the ER or in our crisis system, but, but again, it plays out that way. At the same time, I mean, you see this, this, this um, protectiveness about family, and, and to me that's important because, you know, we value um, one of these other factors that really we have to confront is the fact that our system puts a lot of value, in, I mean, our, our society puts a lot of value, but we've designed our mental health system around this issue client-centered, it's very individualized, it's, you know, this focus on independence, and um, which is wonderful. But what if you come from a community that is not about the individual? What if you come from a community that is about interdependence, about collectivism? And one of the challenges that uh, our community, as well as other communities of color face, is that when they come into a system they come wanting uh, not independence. Uh, they want interdependence. And what we've heard from a lot of our Latino clients is, you know, I don't, I don't seek independence. I feel that I am now independent because my family has isolated me. No one depends on me as they once were, were or did before I was mentally ill. I want to get to a place of healing where my family depends on me as they depended on me before that I'm part of this family structure. I know what it is to feel independent, and it's lonely. And, and again, um, that's, to me, one of the biggest systemic barriers that we have within our system that we have not confronted is that for many of our communities, we are about interdependence, and that's not necessarily congruent with the modes of interventions that we are providing for people. Uh, more importantly, uh, when we begin to include family, the way Latino communities and other communities define family is a lot broader than, you know, um, husband, wife, and 2.5 children. So it is, it provides additional challenges for our system. Um, and again, finally, what's working in our system? I mean, I, I think the point is we have a lot of examples, you know, but those are certainly one component. Um, and, and I think um, you've heard Jerry and, and Ricardo and Yvette talk a little bit about, um, you know, La Cultura Cura and some of the other interventions the National Compadre Network is providing as well as, you know, the work that I did with, and you heard Sammy around Jovenole working with high-risk young Latino males, um, kind of redefining uh, the concepts of manhood. Uh, you certainly heard the distortion that some folks shared and why, uh, you know, the young man was, was saying that that baffled me that I saw something different than what I, what I had in mind. Uh, and that's really some of the work that we've been doing for a very long time. But more importantly, I think that the fundamental 
um, uh, it, it, the, the real important takeaway here is that for me, what's working in our system are, are interventions uh, that, that have, have a, a deep understanding of the communities that we're working with, in this case, Latino communities, um, and have the ability and the expertise to identify the difference between those things that we should consider assets and those things that we should consider deficits that exist within populations or problems or solutions that we have to resolve. And I can tell you right now, I don't think overall our mental health system can differentiate that difference. And that's why there's a significant need right now to um, develop those interventions that are recognizable by the community, not just by mental health, but that the community understands um, what it is that we're bringing to the table. Because in all honesty right now, it isn't very clear to me whether or not I think the, our community, our Latino community, is still deciding whether or not uh, these services are for them. Um, and I think that to me that's a, that's a real important uh, juncture to be at uh, in, terms of county, in, in terms of community mental health that we really have to uh, come to come to grips with. Um, Jerry, yes. Anything you want to add, or? Well, you know, I, no, I just um, I, I think what you mentioned is is so significant in terms of and and it really you know, last week we talked about identity and that the first the first uh, lesson uh, for me with my parents was acknowledgement. You know, it, we, we were told that when you go in somebody's house, you've got to acknowledge everybody, kiss and hug everybody. When somebody comes to your house, you tienes que, you know, levantarse, get there and acknowledge them. And when we go places, we have to greet, we, you know, just, just that acknowledgement. And, and that becomes, you know, if you don't have that, that's that first lesson in life. We go back to that first lesson in life of, uh, are you a blessing? Are you wanted? And I think that's the question that as a population we're struggling with. You know, are we are we are we seen? Ricardo mentioned, "Do I see you? Are you the one?" You know, I mean, do people see us? To really see us and who we really are, and I think there's been such a uh, dichotomy in terms of the discussion and trying to fit us in to, if you will, evidence-based practice or even a model of looking. And and the the way we've looked at really dealing with, if you will, minority or ethnic populations has been really a black-white paradigm looking. You know, they, uh, from an African American point of view, or you know, from a European Western point of view, and and the point of view of, of you know other populations, are it's kind of layered on that. And and I think what systems have done is attempted to you know do a quick fix, and so they take materials. You talk about outreach and education, take materials and we translate them, right? And they just translate, and so they're linguistically understandable, maybe, but in terms of cultural base, in terms of uh, value base. In terms of spiritual base, they're not, and sometimes they cause more confusion. And so we, you know, then provide bilingual translators, but we train the translators and we train the providers in a Western way of looking at this. And so basically, it becomes there becomes more confusion. And again, in the digressionary scale, the first thing is confusion. Do so you get somebody that looks like you, that speaks your language, but is telling you something, or treating you, or giving an intervention that feels weird? It doesn't feel right, and and it, it, it doesn't help you. It doesn't help you in terms of your balance. And I think so. The systemic shift has to be, you know has to be significant, and especially when we look at the demographic uh, trends here. We look at the demographic numbers, especially in California. You know, and look at the numbers. Young children. We're, if 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 we really want to um, deal. Uh, right with the population, we're increasing at a significant number. I saw a number yesterday on the other side that we now have more uh, more Latinos in federal prison than any population. We've surpassed any other population. And so, you know, from the other side, and now a lot of those men are coming out. And many of them, as we mentioned in our last webinar, are, you know, are have been misdiagnosed. A lot of them have mental health issues. But where do they go? You know, what, where do they go for treatment? And what? So I think you know the things that you mentioned systemically are very significant that really need to be addressed. You know, and uh, and that organizations that get funding, um, you know, need to consider the capacity building that they need to do. Any last comments, Google? You wanna? No, I just want to thank everybody. And again, you know, um, I think that Jerry points 
to I think some significant issues just in sheer population um, and where we are at and unfortunately how much further we have to go. Again, there are a lot of successes, but I think in its totality, there is not one county in this state that is not touched by the large number of Latinos and we are, you know, again, only beginning to scratch the surface in terms of how we deal with mental health uh, and more importantly, identifying the, the internal uh, cultural assets that we can utilize to resolve some of these mental health issues, which I, I, again is, is I, I think the imperative for us to look at uh, culturally based approaches that can help identify those. Thank you all very much. You know, I, I, you know, mental health is one area, but also the educational institutions and juvenile justice institutions, you know, um, health institutions as well. You know, the, all those entities that have a, you know, and, and you have children in school as well, so I'm sure you see it from a, as a father, you know, in terms of trying to, 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 uh, to, to guide your children in a good way sometimes in, in systems that, uh, that don't have that understanding either. Correct, and I think that you know doing this work um, as a uh, without children is one thing, and um, having to apply um, even at the level of, of kind of the work that we do, applying it within your own kids and having to confront some of these issues um, is is a little bit um, it, it becomes very real. Um, you know some of the issues that that we dealt with um, early on that now we're dealing with our kids that I thought were gone and having to come to the realization that they're still very much alive in relation to, dis in relationship to discrimination, in relationship to uh, prejudice, a lot of these things. And yet, they looked a little bit different than they did when I was a child, but, but somehow it's evolved and it, it has survived. So, um, uh, and again, that is someone who, you know, my wife and I both work in systems and, and understand and, and can you know, we're bilingual and bicultural, and we still have a challenge, let alone um, a lot of our monolingual uh, and indigenous communities trying to confront some of these issues. Well, thank you, Coco. Um, you know, hopefully you can stay around for some, um, like, any questions that come. Um, what, what, I, what I do want to um, do is kind of summarize a little bit about what, what, what's been shared, and, and we've specifically chosen to talk about, you know, women's and men's issues because we recognize that, that there sometimes are challenges that are, that are very different and wanted to, you know, really give lugar and give space to uh, the reflection of the, the female spirit and because we recognize that, that the carga, the, the, the baggage that continues uh, to, to go on and, and, and it's another layered thing, if you will. And, and so that in the, 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 the struggles that men will go through and the struggles that women go through and then uh, girls and boys and then and then what, what Yvette brought up was very significant in terms of you know, gender identity and, and your own identity, the multiplicity of identities that, that women struggle with and that men struggle with and then and, and finally how do we deal with that in, in a system that sometimes doesn't uh, doesn't know how to identify us even. You know, it doesn't know. Uh, even the forms are not <laughs> large enough and don't have the categories. Um, so even we have to. Some, sometimes we have to check Hispanic. You know, which is a lot of us have take offense to that term. You know, or we become another. And so I think um, when we're talking about the entryway of people into services, those are some some systemic barriers, if you will, the systemic cargas. Uh, that I think on on the other hand. There have been some some inroads, and and there are many uh, a number of counties that are attempting to do uh, some work. I know I mentioned last week that we're doing some work in Merced. There was uh, with the county mental health system. Sharon Jones guides that over there, and and uh, and there's been some work in Santa Cruz County as well. Uh, Jaime Molina and some of the work there that goes on, and and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about those next week. Uh, also in Salinas, that uh, the real creative work that's being done, you know, funded under the endowment uh, of bringing to light the community healers as well. So, you know, talking about the, the sobradores, the, the people that know herbs and know, you know, we have a tremendous uh, historical legacy of healers in our culture. 
that before any systems are present, you know, we, um, you know, we had and we still have. We still have, you know, used probably the remedies, the, the remedies that we'll, we'll talk about those next week a little bit. But we want to then go to the, the questions and see if, um, uh, Sharon, I don't know if there's any questions or any questions from the audience. I, I can't see them up here on the uh, on my screen, but to see if there's any particular questions that people have asked. Uh, yeah, you know, we have some great comments come through and questions. Um, let me back up. Let's see. One of the questions we had was, um, if the book was in Spanish, this is to Dr. Um, Flores Ortiz, she's still on with us? I don't know if she's still on. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it is in, in, in Spanish or not. Uh, but I would imagine that it, it, it will be soon, because that's, it's really focused at Latinas, and you know, we recognize the bilingual um, nature. If, if uh, I would suggest you write to uh, Dr. Flores and and uh, and you know, oh, okay. yeah, and and ask that. But but even the book in English, I think, would be uh, um, is uh, you know, it's valuable. Great. Okay, um, Dr. Flores is with us. We just have her on mute, so we're going to get her off mute. Okay. Uh, we also have someone that's raising their hand asking to make a comment, so we're trying to locate um, okay. <laughs> Adriana. Adriana, can you hear us? No, I didn't like their audio option. <laughs> okay. See, sometimes these systemic things get in the way of the flow. <laughs> <but that's laughs> Let's try this one more time. Process, right? Yeah, right. Adriana, are you with us? Okay, maybe not. We'll, we'll keep working to see if we can pipe Adriana in. She had a comment. Um, another question that came about was, um, <coughs> this is from Al DeBose. Um, you've explained some of the barriers to fitting into an evidence-based model. Has any work been done to measure change, increase assets, or positive outcomes for participants along various domains? Well, we I mean, we definitely have evidence. I mean, uh, one of our curriculums, uh, Hova Noble, is an evidence-based practice. Uh, but but I'll tell you, I mean, the the uh, we have other we we've been doing this work for many many years, even before it was evidence-based practice. I mean, you know, we we talk about community-based evidence is, is our as our marker, and so we have um, uh, evidence on a whole number of domains, from uh, self-concept from stress level, from family relations, from behavioral uh, changes, and, and, uh, and, and self-worth level. So there's been many domains that we have measured. And, and actually, um, we, you know, if you want more information on that, uh, Dr. Uh, Heriberto Escamillo, who's our evaluator and researcher, can, can talk more about that and even the, the process for evaluation. But, but let me just state that there are many, many uh, processes that are culturally based and, and they're trauma-informed and healing-centered that there's no way you can capture and measure the movement that goes on with the spirit, the movement that goes on with, with um, some of the spiritual identity. And some of the practices uh, are, are not, you know, you don't, don't you, you can't measure them because they're not something that are, um, that happen right away. They, they happen over time as well. But I think what, one of the things that we do see, and Dr. Carrillo referred to this, is the, the sense of interconnectedness, of attachment. And we tend to see uh, many people that, that, are, that, that get acknowledged, that, so, so that if we look at, at um, the, uh, you know, the, the process of healing, the first level is acknowledgment, the second level is understanding. When you get a sense of understanding, that somebody finally does embrace uh, what I, my journey has been, the, the struggles that I've had, and, and it's not judging me, it's not shaming me, but somebody embraces that and, and makes me not feel like I'm crazy, if you will, then then there begun, begins to be some hope and change, and we've seen that over the years. So. Yeah, let, let, me, let me add something to that. Um, the, the, uh, that's a good question, because uh, we live in a, in a society that is requiring uh, evidence-based practices. Let me say that our work is 
practice-based evidence. And you'll hear Concha Saucedo speak about that next time uh, because we, our uh, traditional healing approaches are empirically based. We have been observing the healing of people and the reduction of trauma symptomology for, for generations. <clears throat> uh, Sal Nunez, who is our um, uh, therapeutic drummer, uh, Puerto Rican psychologist at City College in San Francisco, has uh, autonomic responses, um, heart rate, <clears throat> blood pressure, um, uh, stress management uh, as a result of doing uh, drumming in a particular way from the bomba tradition that really in fact does reflect using the Western uh, approaches that it does have a significant impact. Uh, Bessel van der Kork has uh, <clears throat> explained for many years the impact of physiological and culturally relevant methodologies, the singing in South Africa, the, um, the, the dance approaches that, uh, that our Mexica people do, it, it becomes a bilateral stimulation that is what uh, EMDR is based on for the use of trauma. So we, uh, as Jerry says, it's hard to really define all that, but there's a lot of work being done. And uh, if we can just get out of the box a little bit and not get stuck on evidence-based practice, having somebody else validate our work, but see the validation in the benefit that people have coming through it. And of course, there's always room for more research. Yeah, I'd like to add something, if I might. Um, last year, a book was published by Guillermo Bernal and Melanie Dominic Rodriguez. It's entitled Cultural Adaptations, Tools for Evidence-Based Practice with Diverse Populations. It was actually published by the American Psychological Association. And in the book, uh, various authors talk about how the tools of measurement need to be adapted in order to adequately, adequately measure what works in our communities, rather than we having to modify what we do to fit the tools that are used for evaluation. And I think this is a step in the right direction. I think another is that there is a lot of anecdotal qualitative narrative evidence that needs to continually be submitted for publication because we need to also change the paradigms of um, evaluation. And um, the work that you, Ricardo, and Jerry do is, is critical and your, public, your book is outstanding and those are the kinds of things that we need to continue to make available to the powers that be to demonstrate how measurement can take form, can take many forms. Yvette, there was a question regarding your book, whether, whether it's in Spanish or not. Not yet, but if um, if there is significant uh, request for it, I yeah. can certainly speak to the publishers and get it translated. Right. That's awesome. I want to make sure we got a couple of comments in here. Um, one from coming from Haiti, Kuza. Unfortunately, losing children is some, sometimes a consequence of mental health struggles, especially in communities of color where children are put into foster care at a much higher rate. Hmm. Well, I, I, think, I think that also points to the significance of what, I mean, we, we know, we know that, that, that you know, uh, people of color get uh, children put in foster care, get children taken away, we get uh, children, uh, young people incarcerated, higher detention rates, higher, all of those things. And, and now when we t layer Im immigration on top of that, deportation. So, and if we, we look to what Dr. Carrillo was talking about in terms of attachment and connection, well, all of those, you know, definitely are traumatic events that, 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 uh, that definitely impact populations. And, and, and a lot of times there's not the adequate amount of, of attention that is placed on the impact of those disconnections. And even the, the women that come, that come over here sometimes without their families. We were at a community meeting and, and um, and a woman spoke up and says, you know, that she had to leave Mexico to come here because they, her children were starving. Yep. And, and there was a, a compadre that was coming over, and he had work for her over here so her children could, could survive. And so she came over every year thinking she was going to go back and bring the children. And now 10 years had passed. And now her son that was 2 when she left was 12. And, and she said and he just got here last year. 
And she says, but I don't know him. Hmm. I don't know who he is and how do I connect with him. And I don't know the system here because uh, I'm afraid. And who's teaching him are the kids on the corner. And I don't want him to get in the gang. Hmm. And, what they, and, and he's acting out in class. And what they're doing is they're sending him to anger management. And, and he doesn't understand any of it. So, you know, I mean, this is, this is the whole aspect of detachment and what happens to our children. And what she was afraid of is exactly what Kuko said. If I go for services, they're going to take my kid away from me. And they're going to deport me. So I think, you know, the question is, is a very, very valid question and something that needs to be considered when we're working with, the, with our population. Yeah, I think there's a lot of tr uh, teacher training that needs to be done as well in terms of identifying the particular needs of children who have been separated from their parents because of the massive deportations of the last few years and the support that's needed to the familial and non-familial caregivers who are uh, taking care of these children in the interim. And I don't see any systematic effort being done to provide support for the teachers and an, and instruction to them of what the issues are that the children are going to be facing, which leads to mislabeling and misdiagnosing of children. Hmm. Yvette, can you speak a little bit to the impact of, of mothers, uh, of, 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 you know, with children that, then, you know, that the accusation is often that they're inadequate and the threat of their children being taken away or even being deported? Absolutely. And, you know, the disempowerment that's been mentioned in terms of coming to a new system, the losses that one is grieving for what was left behind. Uh, many of immigrant women are single parents, uh, separated from their partners for whatever reason. And to have to deal with systems that they do not fully understand and be labeled by these systems as being inadequate when there are no specific criteria being given to them on what it consists, what adequate parenting is in the United States. Yeah. Issues of, of, of discipline, what may be considered discipline that could be viewed as constructed as abusive. You know, psychologists labeling a child parentified when he or in fact is a parental child who's assisting the parents. There are multiple ways which lead to mothers feeling alone, disempowered, blamed, very often feeling very shamed because they're not doing it right despite the best efforts. Mm -hmm. And that certainly contributes to the high rates of depression and anxiety that women carry. Jerry, I have a couple more questions that have come through and a few hands that have raised but are, and a few other comments. And I want to make sure that we get all these in within the next 12 minutes. Okay. Um, Ron has written us and said that this is, there's been some excellent points made from each of the speakers and that also these presentations need to be ongoing education forums in many communities. I wanted to make sure you guys got that information. We had another great question that came from Anne Marie um, that was along the lines of EVPs as well. Um, let me see. Uh, we are aware that the EVPs are not relevant to treatment ethnic, uh, ethnically diverse populations and staff are reluctant to conduct pre- and post-outcome measures. As a result, some are looking at other unwilling streams um, outside of MHSA to fund ethically responsive treatment um, interventions. How do we influence the county policy creators that uh -oh, we are a little freeze here. Um, that have lost sight of the currently created practices. Anyone have a feedback for her? Are you still on Cuckoo? I don't know if Cuckoo's still on. Um, well, I, 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 th yeah, I think you're right. I think that, that what's happened is that other funding streams are, are coming through to, um, to address, you know, the, the health and mental health issues of, of population. And I think that's good, I think, but, but you know, we've also seen some very creative ways of using uh, the innovation dollars, mental health innovation dollars. Like I said, in Merced, you know, they've stepped up and seen the significance of, of providing you know, culturally-based, uh, culturally-competent services, using community partners, 
and and creating um, re building on resiliency in communities. So there are there are flexibility in in um, you know in even in the mental health dollars now. It's just that that uh, communities and and, uh, and and particular jurisdictions have to step up, have to step up and recognize the need. I mean, obviously, if there uh, continues to be more issues among a population, then there's some distress that's going on. And I think that in, 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 instead of incarcerating our youth and, and uh, stigmatizing our families, we need to provide services and treatment for them. Great. Um, one more question, and then I'm going to turn over to Adriana and also Elizabeth Robles. Um, but another question coming from Ron. After starting with policymakers, funding leaders, who are the next level of leaders to share this information? Well, I think I think uh, you know the community first of all, and 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 I think uh, the practitioners, because. Um, you know, the, the community has a, a great influence on, on what goes on, and the community needs to recognize, first of all, and that's what we're doing. We're doing a lot of capacity building with communities. But educational in, in institutions, uh, you know, I mean, in terms of the schools, as Yvette mentioned, the schools is very significant because the schools really uh, become the central point for a lot of the referrals, a lot of the referrals to the children, a lot of the referrals to parents, a lot, of, and, and they become then the central place where many of the distress um, is recognized and then and then triggers a whole lot of other things that, that goes on as well but I also think um, there are other funding sources and that you know in criminal justice system needs to be reoriented and, and again you know we uh, changing some of the, the the criminal justice process to understand the mental health needs of populations that have multi layers of stress uh, is very significant I don't know if you've Jerry? Had a, you want to. Jerry? Yes. Uh, this is Kuko. Okay. I, I, you know, I want to I go to that question because it, it, in terms of where it needs to go and why, um, if it's MHSA related, it needs to go to the community and the community needs to directly affect the process. The way MHSA works is that it is the stakeholders that drive this process, those that are being served and those that have not been served. And that's why it becomes really important that as a strategy, that's why I said early on uh, that one of, the, one of the problems that we had or challenges that we had with MHSA was this idea that all communities are at the same place. Um, there is no statewide Latino or African American advocacy organization for African Americans or Latinos. There is none. Um, there is one in, 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 you know, for English speakers. It's called AMI. So if you don't have those kind of structures to advocate for your position, then you didn't get a seat at the table and you didn't get your issues addressed. The same thing occurs locally. Uh, because of the level of stigma, because of the lack of organization and resources, we don't have those structures. But that doesn't mean that we can't develop them as a process. And more importantly, when it comes to MHSA, that's really what needs to be happening uh, across all the communities, is that these communities need to be empowered to point out that these services are not relevant. And the other final point that I want to get to in terms of evidence-based practices is by definition, an evidence-based practice only works if it is adapted to meet the cultural needs of populations. And that's the one significant piece that people continue to ignore in the implementation of evidence-based practices. Well, and, and I, think, I think additionally when, when uh, a practice gets, gets certified as evidence-based, Many times, the population that that it was uh, normed on is not the population that served. So even w when you do the adaptation, right right there, you're invalidating the evidence, the evidence-based practice. Even though it's a practice that's for general population, the the factors that are that are very different for for ethnic-centered folks. So so it may be evidence-based when it's normed on a certain population, but once you change that population, the whole credibility of, it, of, of being an evidence-based practice changes. Great. Um, here's a, um, I wanted to get to Adriana. She's been sending, she had her hand raised and has sent us a message. Adriana, are you there? Yes. Okay, great. Go ahead and with your question. Um, it, it was a, kind of a, a comment, um, I, and I hear, you know, this, this talk about the evidence-based practices and, you know, how we have to make a moldable um, 
and more appropriate to the Latino culture. Um, here at the clinic that I'm at, we're a directly operated clinic, and we have formed a Spanish DBT team, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy, and um, it's one where we've been able to, um, where it was originally at Harvard UCLA, um, they're the ones that opened, um, that modified it for Latinos, and we're doing it um, here in Long Beach as well. Um, but I, I, I kind of, you know, I hear that at the top it needs to be done, or you know, that the stakeholders should be the ones to initiate it. But it also can be done at the very grassroots levels, like you know, you know, like we've done it, and you know, just as you know, we have we have other practitioners here who have started, um, you know, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy in Spanish, and um, you know, putting a Latino twist to it, um, anxiety groups in Spanish, and doing the same thing. So a lot of it can be done at the grassroots level, but you know, it, it would be nice to have more resources, like everybody was saying, um, that comes from from higher up. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think you know. I think that all of us need to advocate for what uh, what the community needs, and I think that hopefully we're getting we get to the place where we're not having to adapt <clears throat> and translate, but we recognize that within our cultural realm, we generationally have known about healing and have known about treatment and known about intervention. The, the problem is that the systems have not acknowledged that form. In fact. You know, I mean, and I think uh, Samuel some Martinez will talk about this more next week. But we're now, you know, including more uh, uh, practices, you know, from the, the Eastern philosophy more than, even though we have a lot of our own, you know, the meditation and yoga and all of that. And, and all of those are really good practices. But we have a number of those as well. We, we know herbs. We know sovando. We know a whole lot of, uh, you know, a, we have a lot of practices that are intrinsic in our culture that families know that if we were just to recognize and help have water those, they uh, could build their own capacity internally as well. But I, I recognize you, acknowledge you for the work that you all are doing locally, and I think more communities have to do that. Great. Thank you. We have one more question or comment coming from Elizabeth on the line. Elizabeth, are you there? Hello? Okay. We'll come back then. She, her line is open if she does. Come on. Um, we had another question coming from Marco who had stated that he, uh, I find it hard to convince undocumented Latinos that I am not going to tell immigration <laughs> for them. Uh, what suggestions do you have to convince them that it's okay to open up to me without fear of being deported? Well, first of all, I think it's a realistic fear. It's not, it's not just a fantasy. It's a realistic fear, and it goes on every day. Um, I think that um, I would suggest the practitioner uh, get out of the role of just being a practitioner. And, and Ricardo mentioned, and I think Yvette mentioned, the this, this sense of, of connection and conocimiento, and so that when, you, when they just see you as a practitioner, you're part of the system. Mm -hmm. But when they begin to see you as a relationship that you're really concerned with them, and you, you really identify with their concerns. Mm -hmm. that when they leave that office, it may be it's a reality. When mm -hmm. they live in their community, that's a reality. And so it's not necessarily you know that you will report them, but the reality is that that's a, a, a stressor that they face. That's something that they face. And, yeah. uh, and, and by the way, I've seen it happen in systems where, <laughs> where people have said, you know, I'm not going to report you, but then it goes on anyway. So I think it's that personal relationship, it's that connection, um, it's that conocimiento that becomes the, you know, uh, the next step. Um, great. Um, another question, and I just want to let you know we're coming up on our time, so this will probably be the last question that we can go ahead and send out and ask, but we will work with the presenters today with getting a few of the other questions that we weren't able to get to okay. answered and then get you the answers uh, via email. But um, this last question, is there a place to find resources you've used for measuring change or where to find articles? Well, I think all of the presenters here you know, have resources uh, that if you uh, contact them, um, they, you know, years of experience, you also can con contact us at the National Compadres Network, uh, dot com, and we can also connect you. Uh, internally, we have, you know, uh, a whole number of resources as well um, in terms of 
of uh, you know, what we do. We provide a lot of capacity building, a lot of training around these issues, and are connected to is one of the presenters who were also part of a, a larger effort that we're, uh, we're embarking on, not only locally and statewide, but nationally. <laughs> I think that this question we definitely should um, throw out before we do um, depart and leave this webinar today. Is there um, a group similar for women, similar to the Compadres Network? <laughs> um, actually, they're, right now um, they're in the process. There's a Comadres Network that has, has been gathering, and um, it, you know, for years we have. That, that's it's, it's interesting that's asked because we didn't feel that we needed to to. Uh, we didn't feel it was our role to take that on, but there are groups, there are women's groups that, that you know, throughout uh, California and throughout the country, very strong. Yvette may know some of them as well. But what one of the things that the Comadres Network is doing, and they're, they're in their the beginning stages of developing, is that they're developing a resource list of, uh, of, of women's groups, women's support groups, women's uh, guidance groups, women's mentor groups, healing groups, all of that. And so that hopefully should be available um, you know, within this year sometime. But that is you know, the process that's going on. Again, if you want more information, you can contact us and we can, uh, you know, send you to the mujeres that are, that are uh, guiding that process. Great. Well, Jerry, that seems to be our time. Yeah. Um, we'll leave it to you to close us on out. Okay. Well, I uh, just want to thank everybody and, and, and really just, you know, thank um, um, Yvette and Ricardo and Cuco for uh, just for who they are for the tremendous amount of work. What you heard today is is you know a lot of years of experience, but more than that, real real strong commitment and passion for for people and, and healing. And, and I was really you know personally, I just want to thank all of you for spending this time. Um, I want to encourage people to reach out to them, and especially you know that has that book. I think uh, it's a wonderful book. And uh, Ricardo as well, his publication. Well, I want to thank uh, all of you for attending. And, and again, I look to December 11th. We're going to have uh, several wonderful presenters as well talking about remedios and curaciones or beyond treatment of culturally based healing. Thank you all from uh, CIMH for uh, your support in guiding all of this. And we'll uh, see you next time. Thank you. Everyone, if you could please make sure to do your evaluation as you exit this webinar, we greatly appreciate it. Everyone, have a great day today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Too. Bye. -bye.